The craze brought glamour to the gangster business. Their name has become a brand name for gangster chic. But while the craze basked in publicity, another gang, better organised and far more powerful, spread its violent influence away from the flashbulbs. The underworld knew them as the Richardson Gang, or simply the Torture Mob. They carved a terrifying reputation out of the bodies of their victims. The scruffy little firm, the craze. <laughs> Very powerful, uh, Richardson's. And you didn't mess about with well, boys, you, you came out of there crippled. If you were still alive at all. Naughty boys, they were naughty boys. <laughs> July the 30th, 1966. A day this country has never forgotten. The game started badly for our football heroes. But not as badly as that very same day started for the Richardson gang. The Ramsey spirit, believing that with sustained attack, the goals must come. For over a year, Alf Ramsey's men had trained for this heady day. All that time, police officers had been secretly investigating London's most powerful gang. At dawn, on World Cup final day, 70 officers raided homes across the southeast. They seized the gang leader, Charlie Richardson, in bed. There was no controversy about the police's achievement. That famous day, the power of the Richardsons was broken. Eleven of the gang were charged. You had the craze North London, Richardson South London. But I think the Richardsons were far more violent than the craze. The craze would cause damage and perhaps beat up somebody or burn their shops down or their workshops, but um, the Richardsons were, they were frighteners, really vicious people. As the craze lieutenant, Albert Donoghue was a hard man, a dangerous man. But even he was wary when entering the Richardson South London Manor. They had all the all the top hard men from South London. All the dangerous people were, were working for the Richardsons. Yeah. Why did they need people like that? Is uh, to well to instill fear. Indian country, we called it. South London. Like going amongst the Cherokees. They ruled their empire with, um, with violence and fear. And uh, subsequently, the torture trial, it uh, exemplifies how far they would go. At the trial in 1967, the jury heard evidence of sadistic brutality rarely heard in an English court. Petty fraudster Benny Coulston gave a chilling account of his torture. In the dock sat Charlie Richardson, the leader, his younger brother Eddie, and their notoriously violent enforcer, Frankie Fraser, already named Mad Frankie. Francis, Francis Fraser, sir. What did he do? He went and brought back a pair of pliers, sir. And he put the pliers into my mouth. And he tried to grab my teeth, sir. And then he ripped the top of my gum, sir. He cut the gum inside? Yes, sir. Here, sir. What else? And then he happened to catch a couple of my teeth and crush them with the pliers, sir. Nowadays, Frankie Fraser has become a celebrity 
turning his reputation for gruesome violence into a money-making act. He jokes about gold-plated pliers and his nickname, The Dentist. When you were out of prisons on those rare moments, you did terrible things to some people. In your world, and the viewers' world, yes, I suppose I did, but not in our world. Because the people were mostly people like me. Rascals. The blood was just dripping down my face. The torture trial revealed a brutality that was unacceptable in any world. When confronted, Fraser dismisses the evidence. You tried to pull out his teeth and pulled out his gums? That's what he says, but not through none of it. I wish it had been. Today, Richardson and Fraser are still bound by the secrets of their criminal past. They have done things no sane person will admit to. Charlie Richardson, now 67, will only talk to a movie company prepared to make a financially rewarding, sanitized story of his life. This film gives a voice to people forgotten when violence is glamorized, those broken by brutality. We found a witness to the torture and have identified two men involved in killings on the orders of Charlie Richardson. And for the first time, Benny Coulston, the man Fraser attacked with pliers, has agreed to speak publicly. Even now, 34 years later, he fears being recognized. Oh, my face, was, my face was out here and... I was in such a state that I didn't care, really. I didn't care where I lived or died. Because I was in... I was, you know, I was really, really... really, really hurt. I was really in pain. Coulston said the torture began when he was knocked almost unconscious in the street and taken to Charlie Richardson's office. On the desk was a Luger pistol. I asked him what I was here for, and then I was struck with an iron bar across the eye, sir. At utter rubbish. Utter. He had untold convictions, the guy. Did you hit him on the head with a metal object? I only wished I had of. No, I didn't, no. And then I was ordered to be stripped, you know. Took all my clothes off, everything was took off. He said to me, I took £600 off of two of these men in the shop. Richardson accused Coulston of defrauding a member of the gang out of £600. One hit me with a, right across the face with a log of wood. Then I got another crack across the head with a log of wood. They hit me with everything. Metal? Yeah, everything. Coulston told the court Eddie Richardson had a go. He just got this lump of wood and went right across my toes with it. But then, I, the pain was just gone, like, if you could blame me, like, the pain was gone. It, you know, I couldn't feel no more pain. The person I thought was dead anyway. The outcome of the eight-week trial was always uncertain. Charlie Richardson was a master at fixing juries. The police were ready. 170 police officers watched the jury 24 hours a day. Yet still, direct attempts were made to threaten or bribe two jurors and two witnesses. One of those was Coulston. Armed detectives guarded him for five months to ensure he gave evidence. I could not see because there was too much blood running down my face and my eyes. He said, take him outside and dip him in that bath really cold water and just chucked me in it and all of a sudden he pushed me under and all the blood was in it like. To this day, Colston cannot forget the man who orchestrated his torture. He just didn't care. He was laughing. Richardson? Yeah. Charlie Richardson? Charlie Richardson, yeah. He was, he was a mad man. He, he was just laughing? He was just laughing. I think, I don't like the sight like on television, but I think he was just a bit of a maniac. Like he, I think he liked seeing people naked, being tortured. He wasn't a man, he was an animal.
the Crays were in the gangster business for glamour and reputation. Charlie Richardson was in it for money. Charlie Richardson, I think, is a very intelligent man, clever man. Shrewd, acute, astute. Intelligent, well, in, well read, very well read, convivial, good company, and can be a gentleman. On the other side, be brutal. All of a sudden, he could just turn. Unlike the craze, he was a clever, if ruthless, businessman with assets of about one million pounds, much amassed through his criminal empire. Yet he was born in 1934 with few advantages in life. His mother worked in a tea house. His father was often away in prison or chasing women. These were hard years, and Hitler's bombs made life harder in Camberwell, South London, where Charlie was brought up. Charlie was a habitual truant. He formed a young gang with his friends, battled other gangs, taunted local bobbies, and scavenged on bomb sites. Me and Charlie was very good pals, and we used to go out looking for bits of bomb with our tin hats on. We was only eight, nine years old, you know. And um, that's when I first met Charlie. Life was different in the war. Completely new world. Rations, clothing Cubans, petrol Cubans. Oh, it was a paradise for a thief. Absolutely. I'll never forgive Hitler for surrendering. It was wonderful. You could steal anything and people bit your hand off to buy it off you. Days of wartime austerity were replaced by a craving for consumer goods. Charlie Richardson nicked goods off lorries, stripped lead off roofs, and became an expert at stealing cars. I behaved very badly. Eventually, when I was 14 years of age, I was in trouble with stealing a car and stopping away from school, truanted, and I was placed in an approved school for naughty boys. Two years with other thieves and embryonic gangsters hardened the young Richardson. Working out at the Lynn Boxing Club with his younger brother Eddie prepared Charlie to take on anyone. Charlie was a fighter. And he proved himself with his fists and everything. I mean, he terrorised people, there's no mistake about it. Everyone was terrified of him. He now proved himself in business. He started in scrap metal and by the age of 22 owned six scrapyards in South London with a turnover of a quarter of a million pounds. He didn't care where the metal came from. He'd buy anything, Charlie, obviously, anybody would, you know. But, um... Didn't matter if it was stolen? Of course not, no. You know, and the police never used to worry. They never used to raid you then, did they? You'd get the old Bobby on the beat come in and look around and get five bob and go away. That's the end of it. Richardson learned it wasn't just bobbies on the beat who could be bribed. When just 18, he bought two planes for scrap, but defrauded a business partner out of thousands of pounds. Two fraud detectives visited his scrapyard. And uh, Charlie said, now, what do you want? So they said, well, we want a nice holiday for our wives and ourselves and... Uh, I think it was about £300 each. And it was off your back, you know, no more troubles. If we didn't pay these people money, my customers had all kind of harassment. My premises were searched. And I mean, it's a strong form of black belt and it had to be paid. Everybody else paid the police off, every other metal merchant. If I didn't pay them off, I'd have been in a very vulnerable position. How much would you pay off in a year? Well, I've, I've never really thought about it, really, but I suppose it went into thousands of pounds. Thousands right? of pounds? Yes, I would say so. To everybody, really. People who finished up right at the top of the scale, commanders at Scotland Yard. I mean, we got arrested, but we released the next day. Or well, the same day, to come to that. No, he had powerful friends, Charlie did. With policemen in his pocket, Richardson expanded his criminal empire. His victims had nowhere to go. 
One villain called Mickey Roth, who upset Richardson, felt the force of his anger. He said, what? Let's go round and get hold of him. Went round, got hold of Mickey Roth, bashed up Dookie Lynch, chucked him out a window, bashed up Golly Lands, chased Mickey Roth in a car, shot at Mickey Roth, right, put bullet holes in his brother's car, Danny Roth. The more the Richardsons believed they were untouchable, the more violent they became. By the end of the 50s, the Richardsons' tentacles spread across South London. They had pubs and clubs and money coming in from protection. Anyone causing trouble on their patch was dealt with. But they dreamt of being so feared, no one would even challenge them. The man they needed was Frankie Fraser, gangland's most feared enforcer. They saw an opportunity. While Fraser was in prison, one of his relatives was beaten up by another South London gang. Well, wasn't that wonderful what they'd done? Eddie and Charlie, they found out who they were and knocked them about, which was wonderful. Lovely gesture. And that's why I went in with them. Why did Charlie want Frankie Fraser in his firm? Uh, well, Frank is a, he's a legend, actually, isn't he? I mean, everybody knew Frank. And uh, Frank was, if Frank was on the firm, people left you alone. Fraser. Dangerous little bastard, yeah. Oh, yeah, he'd kill you. Cut you to pieces. He led a gang that slashed and bludgeoned Jack Spot, former king of the underworld. You had a fearsome reputation. Yes, I did. And Charlie Richardson asked you to join them? He did, yes. They knew you were a man who showed gratitude, showed yes. respect. Yeah, very much. You'd be there to help them? All the way. Right whatever. Hand, right hand man? Whatever. And you would do whatever you, they asked you to do? If that was necessary, yes. By the early 60s, Charlie Richardson had gathered together an unrivaled team of hard men. Eddie Richardson always struck me as being uh, an animal. There's no finesse about him at all. He was just an animal. He had some people on the firm, yeah. He had, he had. George Cornell, who was known yeah, for his... George, yeah, George was all right. He was, a, you know, he just used to take too many pills, didn't he, George? But he had a reputation for violence. Oh, yeah, George, yeah, yeah a reputation, yeah. Jimmy Moody? He... Oh, Jim, yeah, Jimmy Moody. What was Jimmy Moody like? <laughs> he was all right, he was just a bad man, that's all right. Not a bad man in himself, but you couldn't cross him, you couldn't. What happened if you crossed him? Yeah, something very nasty. <laughs> I knew Jim very well. He had Frazier, he was a thug. He had uh, Clark, another thug. But Charlie mastered them. He was the number one. He was the area commander, if you like. Across the Thames on the east side, the Cray twins, who dreamt of becoming a criminal family to compare with Al Capone, watched the rise of the Richardsons with apprehension. The Crays would never had two, Bob. They never really earned a lot of money. It would only be like sort of 300 quid a week out of that club or 200 quid a week out of that club. There wasn't businessmen at all. They just wanted their name in the paper and glory and um, be seen with like this star or that star. The Richardsons was 10 times far more successful. At the fashionable Astor Club, where gangsters were as welcome as celebrities and nobility, the two gangs would come face to face. We had enjoyable times there. All the girls knew us down there. Until Georgie Cornell, he used to go down there and bump into Ronnie Cray and call him a fucking puff. And then they wanted to start fighting each other. But Reggie usually pulled Ronnie off and Charlie usually pulled you know, Georgie Cornell off already. 
One incident at the Astor reminded the Crays just how dangerous the Richardson men were. In 1964, their right-hand man, Frankie Fraser, had an argument with another villain called Eric Mason. Mason, according to Fraser, threatened to seek the help of the Crays. I kidnapped him, slung him in, took him to our workplace and done him with an axe and slung him outside the hospital with the axe in his head. When he saw the axe coming, he tried to put his hands on it, he put his yes, hands on he his did. head? and it went right through his fingers into his head, yeah. Lovely axe. You could have killed him. I could have killed him, yes. But Charlie Richardson did not want to go to war with the Crays. His ambition was to be a multimillionaire, not the number one gangster. To achieve this, he turned increasingly to fraud. He set up phony companies to sell goods he'd not paid for. The companies collapsed, and the goods were sold before manufacturers and the fraud squad arrived. They was doing it quite a lot, yeah. What sort of goods? Fancy goods, anything. Booze. Clothes. Radios, transistors, you name it. Irons, scales. You name it. If the firm would supply it, he's in business with it. Would Charlie Richardson, would he be on the company documents with his name appear? Oh no. Oh no. Charlie was taking the biggest cut, but we all had plenty to live on and nice cars, you know, new cars and that. Richardson enticed into his web characters like Frank Prater, who invented some of the most spectacular frauds of that era. But Prater would only work as a consultant. He would not front any of the frauds. The man Richardson really wanted to employ was Jack Duval, one of the top con men. Well, take Jack Duval, he had a front like no one's business, you know, he could go anywhere, and he could literally con you out of millions. He had no compunctions whatsoever of, of, uh, of um, ripping somebody off, you see. Jack Duval used to spend £5,000 a night at the Astor Club and didn't even miss it. It wasn't his money anyway. Richardson persuaded this astute con man to work with him. But Richardson was so driven by greed, he assumed all his team of villains and con men were stealing from him, especially Jack Duval. Later he wrote, Loyalty become absolutely essential to me. I was working in a world where theft was part of the game. I wanted people who was willing to give their undying loyalty to somebody they could look up to. Anyone who got caught doing something wrong was really put on trial. We used to have these mock trials. They even had robes people got for us from the old Bailey, the prop oh, full trappings. I was defence a couple of times. I don't think I ever won a case. Eddie won in every case, you know. But we, Eddie was the prosecutor, Charlie was the bloody judge, so what chance do you have anyway? There was more humour in it than anything. It was more or less to terrify the people who was up against Charlie and uh, teach him a lesson at the same time. And I took part in two of them. They'd both given good ideas and then and we started the torture business then, you know, the proper torture business. When Richardson feared Duval was spending his cash, he dispensed with the trial and declared him guilty. Charlie gave him such a fucking smack. Knocked him clean over and says, how can you turn us over, Jack, you know, and what we've done for you and all that. Jack was crying and smothered in blood. Charlie started kicking him. And then I think Mad Frankie Fraser gave him a smack as well. The torture trial in 1967 heard Duval got his revenge by stealing £1,500 from Richardson before fleeing abroad. Richardson then tortured two of Duval's friends to find where the con man was hiding. The first was Lucian Harris. He said he was threatened, beaten, and that after a meal break, Charlie Richardson thrust his thumbs deep into his eyes. Harris said a portable hand electric generator was then brought in, and the leads were attached to his big toes. But he turned the handle of the generator, sir. Well, I felt a shock. I felt myself jump up and I landed on the floor. Harris said the torture was repeated, time and time again, for an hour. To what part of 
parts of your body. First to the calves of each leg, then, then to the thighs, to the anus, to the penis, um, to the chest, across the nose uh, and across the temples. Bunny Bridges, another of Duval's friends, suffered identical torture. Charlie said, Johnny, Roy, take him upstairs and put him on the torture box. Make him fucking talk. So we stripped him cold cut and uh, sat him in the bath of water. Then put this electric thing on him. And you put that, connect that to a bloke's private part and he springs that eye out of the water. And he fucking screamed like a pig. And we kept saying, tell us where he is, Bunny, and we stop. And he kept saying, he doesn't know, he doesn't know, he doesn't know, which he didn't know. Charlie Richardson used torture as a business tool to impose discipline and fear across the criminal underworld. Employees running a lucrative car park scam at Heathrow Airport were touched by this fear. In 1965, car park staff were making £100,000 a year by fiddling dates and times on parking tickets. A huge sum when their wages were about £750 a year. Frankie Fraser and the Richardsons persuaded them to hand over £500 every week. Frank Prater witnessed how one key employee was persuaded. Fraser is there. I know him. And uh, all of a sudden, they bring this guy in from the, sort of the underneath the other part of the cellar. A cell, if you like. Charlie's the judge now, you see. And he says... Right, strip off, and the guy stripped down, took all his clothes. These others, two were there, they had wet towels, so, so I've got an idea what might happen, I've seen to think it's going to happen to me. They give him a couple of slaps with these towels, frightened him. There was a sheer frightening effect on him, and not so far short of that on me. He told them the whole story, who did it, who didn't do it, what they did and how they did it. And there's Charlie sitting there listening to it all. You didn't persuade them to give some of the money to Charlie Richardson? No, but no. You didn't strip one of the men naked? No, I wasn't charged with it. You ever? You didn't. You didn't beat any of them? No, wasn't charged. Here's your answer. The police decided the man who had been beaten was too traumatized to give evidence in court. For a time, the torture sessions worked. Criminals lived in fear. Even the Crays were wary. On the other side of the river, even the Cray gang was shaken by the torture stories they heard. They were torture, torture merchants, you know. They used electrical generators and shit like that. Did you hear about the torture before it got into the newspapers? Oh, yeah. They heard about our beatings and cuttings and shootings. But at least ours was fast and clean, as opposed to being long drawn out. You know? Pinochet shit, you know what I mean? Ours was more Clint Eastwood. For some years, there was an uneasy truce between the Crays in East London and the Richardsons in South London. That truce was shattered in the West End. And then the gambling started, one-armed bandits. Now, that's when all the trouble started, because the Crays were putting them one-armed bandits in some of their clubs. Eddie Richardson and Mayor Frankie was pulling them out and putting their own in. And that started all the friction with the two gangs. They were both competing for the same market in the West End of London. The Richardsons and the Crays. Extortion, one-armed bayonets, gambling. Oh, you name it, they were doing it. Frankie Fraser ran the slot machine business with Eddie Richardson. The more successful they became, the more the Crays envied them. You were getting a lot of money from the West End. Yes. Thank God for that. And they would have liked that? Yeah. They did used to ask us, can you put us in, Frank? And I, to be honest, I used to say, no, I'm sorry. Can't be done, Rich. Can't be done, Ron. I said, OK, Frank. 
If you ever change your mind, we'd have a laugh about it and a drink. Yeah. I got on so well with them and liked them. Ronnie wouldn't talk to him. Ronnie was like a Doberman. He was snarling, you know, he wanted, he wanted to eat him. Yeah. Poison Dwarf, that's how he called him. While tensions were rising in the West End, Charlie Richardson was in South Africa, preparing for a golden future. Here, colour of skin mattered, not a South London accent. Richardson believed he could start a new life as a respectable mining magnate. But, in the land of his dreams, he would be accused of the ultimate crime, murder. And his empire would begin to crumble. It began when a man called Thomas Waldeck persuaded Richardson to invest tens of thousands of pounds in a mining venture. I thought what Charlie was being conned and it turned out in the end he was being conned. Well, he was pouring the money in but there was nothing to show for it. Bradbury had drifted away from the Richardson gang but Richardson found him in South Africa. So I said, how's things going Charlie? He said, no, that shit with that Waldeck has got to be taken care of. So I said, well, I can't do it, Charlie, he knows me, you know. He said, no, figure something out and get rid of him, he owes me fucking thousands. Bradbury says he refused to shoot Thomas Waldeck, but, he alleges, Richardson threatened him, his wife and children, and sent out a dangerous villain called Harry Prince. We drove round to his house at Melrose. Just before we got to Waldeck's house, we stopped, put stockings over our heads, then we went up the, uh, well, not on the driveway, up the grass. And uh, Prince rang the bell, went to his front door, which is a big glass front door. And uh, every Prince pumped about nine bullets in him. Prince vanished, but in April 1966, Bradbury was convicted of Waldeck's murder and sentenced to death, later commuted to a life sentence. In prison, Bradbury agreed to meet senior detectives from Scotland Yard. He gave a detailed statement, which we have obtained. He outlined Charlie Richardson's role in the death of Thomas Waldeck and gave the first complete picture of the Richardson gang from the inside. The tortures, the frauds, the police corruption, the intimidation. South Africa is now Johnny Bradbury's sanctuary. As an informer, he still fears returning to the streets of London. But today, Charlie Richardson strongly denies he masterminded Thomas Waldeck's murder, saying he lost his entire investment. I, did, I didn't really think he wanted to kill him. I think he wanted his money back. Because he first told Prince to shoot him in the kneecaps, just to teach him a lesson. But Prince just pulled it through the front door and fucking shot him. That was it. Astonishingly, in March 1966, this man also accused Charlie Richardson of being behind the death of a second man. He is Irish fraudster Carl Waldner. Charlie Richardson denies even knowing him. But we can reveal for the first time a devastating statement Carl Waldner made to Scotland Yard detectives. In it, Carl Waldner alleges he and Harry Prince, the man who did the South African shooting, travelled to the Irish city of Galway to find a man who owed Charlie Richardson £50,000. Richardson had told them to shoot the man, called Peterson, if he did not pay up. Prince pistol-whipped Peterson, but he refused to pay. Carl Waldner's statement details the next dramatic moments. Prince hit him a few more times whilst I held him. Then Peterson started screaming. Prince panicked and shot him in the left shoulder. 
Peterson was moaning on the ground, gasping, when Prince hit him on the head with a revolver. He was unconscious. We pushed him into a ditch at the side of the road. The statement says Carl Waldner and Prince reported back to Charlie Richardson. Charlie asked Prince whether Peterson was dead, to which Prince replied, I don't know. Charlie called us a pair of stupid bastards and that we better pray he was dead. Charlie gave us about £200 a piece there and then. Charlie Richardson's violence was so frequent and so extreme there was always a chance a victim might talk and bring his empire crashing down. James Taggart was the man with the courage to destroy Charlie Richardson. His terrifying story emerged publicly at the torture trial. Taggart, a fraudster, said he was abducted in the street by Charlie Richardson and Fraser. Taggart's mistake was merely to owe money to someone who in turn owed a member of the gang. I was struck several times um, over the head. What with? It would have been a heavy instrument because my head was cut and uh, I was bleeding quite heavily. Half conscious, Taggart was driven to one of the Richardson yards. And inside the office, what happened? Well, I was beaten again. My clothes were taken from me. Which clothes? All of my clothes. Richardson and Clark were using their fists, and then Fraser picked up a wooden pole. Uh, he was striking me across the head with it. He said that you broke a two-inch wooden pole on his head? Did you do that? No, definitely not. Complete and utter rubbish, honestly. So I only wished it had been through. I wished I had broke that across his head, as he said. Blimey, I'd, but I'd have been happy. There was a lot of blood streaming from my head, and most of my body was covered in blood. It, uh, it splashed over the walls of the office and on the floor. And was it allowed to remain there? No, I was forced to clean the blood. Using what to mop it up? My pants. Taggart then told the court that Frank Prater, whom Richardson consulted on his frauds, was summoned to the office. Charlie said, he said, you know who that is, and on the floor I see a bundle, a naked body. He said, I said, no, I don't know who it is. And he said, well, I want you to look through the paperwork and let me know because he got £3,000. What struck me was just the fact the head seemed to be twice the size it should be. It seemed to be. I was shocked. I was, I really was, I couldn't believe it. The I just couldn't could believe it. People be so it. vicious. Hmm? The people were, could be so vicious. And take it so calmly. It's just casual. As if it was an everyday thing, you know what I mean? Apparently they brought him in about four o'clock in the afternoon. This was now seven o'clock at night. Anyway, there was three thousand pounds there. That was that. And once they were clarified that, then it was all over. I was... I was warned by Fraser that I would be killed if I attempted to report to or contact the police. But four days later, after a guarantee of confidentiality, Taggart saw a doctor. I was shocked when I saw him. It reminded me of an experience during the war when a fighter pilot, a German fighter pilot, came down in flames. He was being fried alive and that struck me for the rest of my life and he reminded me straight away of that German pilot. His ears right up, his face all puffed up, his eyes. He had been very, very beaten. His back was all lashes, stripes of uh, terrible. Terrible. There you were with a record of violence. Yes, true. Yeah? And whenever you go to court, you say you're innocent. That's quite right. 
So why should we believe that you were innocent this time? No, I d don't care whether you believe me or not, but that's a fact. I should think he'd been tortured worse than anybody could be tortured outside of the, the old days of the Nazis or things like that. He was really... It's hard to believe, it really is hard to believe. For three months, Taggart stayed silent, fearing corrupt police officers would report back to Charlie Richardson. But then in October 1965, Charlie Richardson and Frankie Fraser stopped him in the street. Terrified, he fled. Not trusting London's police, he went to see the one top detective he knew was honest, Gerald MacArthur, assistant chief constable of Hertfordshire. Over the next nine months, events would spiral beyond even Charlie Richardson's control. The Crays were as keen as the police to destroy the Richardson gang. Reggie was a nice man, but Ronnie was... He was paranoid. He was a schizo, you know? And they was frightened that they might want to encroach on their property. All Cray men were put on alert. When the Crays went south of the river, they knew this was enemy country. Hired car. Shooter in the door pocket. There's your defence. It's not my car, it's not my gun. But if any of the Richardson firm had come on, on us, they'd got shot. The Crays came up with a plan to protect their territory. Ronnie, in his sort of half dream world, decided to cut London up. As if it was like prohibition days in Chicago. Richardson uh, was because he, he was so well off. He said, Nah, they want to know. Fuck you. We we'll stay on our own. But Richardson said they were, they were the enemy. They were the Axis, we were the Allies. The rivalry between the Crazy and the Richardson could have erupted into a gang war. I mean, everyone had arms, revolvers and that. Ronnie had a list. He always had a list of names, and everyone on that list had to go. But uh, he told us everyone's got to do one. And by do, you mean kill? Yeah. Oh, yeah. When the word was given, go, we were going to hit six of their top men so you would annihilate the firm yeah. Yeah. so ronnie cray was preparing for war yeah absolutely but it wouldn't have been a battle it would have been a strike bosh in the early hours of march the 8th 1966 the richardson gang was dealt a grievous blow not by the crays but by a group of south london villains led by billy hayward during a bloody gunfight at a Catford nightclub, one of Hayward's men was killed, but not before they had wounded four of the Richardsons, including Eddie Richardson and Frankie Fraser. More damagingly, both would be jailed for five years. Ronnie Cray seized his chance to try and finish off the Richardson gang. Just 16 hours later, another of Richardson's thugs lay dead. George Cornell went for a drink in The Blind Beggar and was killed by Ronnie Cray. And all that stuff about calling Ronnie a puff, that was nonsense. Three weeks before the Mr. Smiths, he was with the twins having a drink. There was no problem there. So why did Ronnie Cray shoot him? Because he was the only one left. The only hard man left? The only one of the Richardsons firm. Me for I'll oh, clean up, bosh, do him. In July 1966, the police were ready to strike. Torture victims had broken their silence. The police promised they did not have to sign their statements until all the Richardson gang were behind bars. One of those was Benny Coulston, whom Fraser had attacked with pliers. Charles Richardson come, 
over and said, let me have a go at him. He come round with his electric fat fire rod. He asked me to beg and I wouldn't, I just wouldn't beg. Coulston said he was then burnt with cigars. Well, Charlie didn't say, well, we can't let him go, like, and all that. Um, we better get rid of him, like. Coulston said he was tied up, laid on a large tarpaulin, and two heavy weights brought in. Charlie said, where's the nearest bridge? And Eddie said, Vauxhall Bridge. So, naturally enough, I thought that uh, I was going to be done up and chucked over the bridge. But as Coulston awaited his fate, the gang realised their mistake. Coulston had not defrauded a member of the gang. They let Coulston go and he eventually went to hospital. But he fled when a doctor came to give him a blood test. Knowing it was snowing and I'd done a three mile runner with my pyjamas on. I had no shoes on and freezing cold but I didn't feel nothing because already. I mean I was already half dead anyways. What were you scared of at that moment? You were in a hospital? Well, I was frightened that it was crooked doctors and they was going to give me a needle and put me to sleep. You know, something like that. I don't know. You thought Richardson was so powerful? Yeah, I thought they were so powerful. I thought... The power of the Richardson gang was eventually broken by the courage of their victims. Charlie Richardson got 25 years for grievous bodily harm. His brother Eddie received 10 years. As did Frankie Fraser, on top of the five years they both were serving for a fray at the nightclub. The judge said Charlie Richardson was the vicious and sadistic leader of one of the most dangerous gangs he'd ever heard of. In 1990, Eddie Richardson was sentenced to 25 years for conspiring to smuggle 50 million pounds worth of drugs into Britain. Charlie Richardson, now 67, still pursues his dreams of making a legitimate fortune in mining. But those of his victims, who are still alive, will never see him as a respectable businessman. One victim was his very own father. Well, he hasn't threatened me, he's actually done me. I've got six digits in my eye there that he gave me the last time in the club. Uh, nothing, he gave me six digits, I had to fly. And he said, get out quick before he kills you. So let's be son. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Praise Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.